So anyway, welcome everyone. Yeah. And uh, so are you are you all kind of really uh, you know long term meditators? Or are you bit, someone beginners here, or are you, is it kind of a mixture? Or uh, is anyone a beginner? Uh, you, if you're beginners, okay, okay, good. Uh, so welcome. <laughs> So usually the one thing about meditation practice is that uh, it is really the beginner stuff that is important uh, because if you get the beginner stuff right everything tends to flow uh, so everyone should always listen to beginners instruction for meditation if it's called advanced meditation you know it's not real meditation uh, there's no such thing because meditation is so simple so how can it be advanced uh, all you need is your breath uh, and you need mindfulness there's two things uh, you got those two things you're in business uh, so uh, it's so simple, and I think part of the problem with meditation is that we complicate it too much. Uh, instead of saying, staying with the simple things and trying to understand how those work, uh, we make it too difficult. And that is kind of part of the big part of problem uh, with meditation practice. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some very uh, simple guidance to, uh, this morning, and we'll talk a bit more about meditation this afternoon. Uh, but now just kind of begin with some really simple stuff. Uh, which is very useful stuff be precisely because it's simple. So uh, listen. <laughs> so uh, the um, idea of uh, meditation, in fact, the idea of the whole spiritual path uh, is the idea of enhancing the quality of your life. Uh, well, the idea is to improve things, to get better, uh, so you can relax, you can find some ease, uh, you can eventually maybe find some joy and happiness through meditation, all of these kinds of things. Uh, so the idea is an improvement in the quality of life. Uh, and what that means is that that's a very good guide for you uh, right there, whether your meditation is right or not. Uh, yeah, because you're, if somehow the meditation is going funny, it is going wrong, you feel a bit kind of out of sorts, you feel that you're uh, feeling confused or you get angry. If you get angry in meditation, it's a bad sign, right? Uh, but sometimes people do actually get angry in meditation, yeah, all of these emotions can come up. Uh, so you want to make sure, the idea is, if you're on the right track, as you progress through the, through the day, or as you progress through a single meditation, uh, when you come out of your meditation at the end, uh, you should feel more at ease, uh, more relaxed, more mindful, all of these kind of good things. You feel as if you're, you know, your heart is in a good place, or however you want to call it. Uh, and that is a very good guideline for whether you are, things are going in the right way or not. Uh, and this is not just about individual meditation. This is about your spiritual practice overall. Yeah, your entire life of spiritual practice. Uh, you should feel that there's a general movement in a good direction. Uh, in fact, the Buddha says uh, that uh, we should uh, regularly evaluate our spiritual path to see whether we're heading in the right direction. Uh, and the way you know that is if your the Buddha says your good qualities are increasing uh, and your bad qualities are going down. Uh, and if you see this general trend over long periods of time, yeah, after six months or four months, uh, not after two weeks or one week, yeah, because uh, day, on a daily basis, life can be very up and down. Uh, but over the long run, there should be like a trend. Uh, and that's kind of really exciting. When you start to feel that you are on this trend, yeah, going in one direction, uh, it's like you start to wonder, what if I keep on going on this trend, uh, where is it going to end? Uh, up there somewhere. <laughs> Right, it's going to go somewhere really interesting because there is like a, you can start to have this idea. You can extrapolate from where you are now, and you know that it's going to go somewhere really exciting. If it's this good, uh, just by going a little bit, uh, actually, it's going to, it's a very extraordinary, interesting path that we are on. Uh, and uh, there is one uh, simile that the Buddha uses for this idea of spiritual practice, uh, and he says that he talks about his own life and his own. Uh, this is like his own autobiography, if you if you like, uh, and he talks of, in, and he says like uh, the discovery of the Dhamma and the insight into these teachings. Uh, it's, it's like going in a jungle, uh, and one day as you're walking through the jungle, you find this path, uh, and then you follow this path in the jungle. And when you follow that path, uh, you come to an ancient city. Uh, yeah, and when you come to that ancient city, you tell everyone else about it, uh, and then you kind of expand and it. When everyone hears about it, they get excited and interested because ancient cities are always very interesting. Yeah? And they kind of clear it out and make it beautiful and, and nice. Yeah? And so for the Buddha, and this is kind of the nice thing about it, it's like an adventure. Yeah? Yeah, if you go into the jungle and find an ancient city somewhere, yeah? that's kind of exciting. Yeah? Yeah, I don't know, as a child, I always, because uh, I grew up in Norway, lots of forests and mountains in Norway. Yeah? I love to explore the forest and find weird rocks and weird little caves and things and kind of hanging out. Uh, and that exploration is kind of, I think, something very 
fundamental to human beings. We want to explore, we want to kind of go somewhere, we want to have a sense of meaning in life. Uh, and the Buddhist path is the most exciting adventure and exploration that anyone can do. Uh, and this is what the Buddha, I think, is saying, part of this idea of the simile of the ancient city in the forest. Uh, so it is interesting, uh, it is meaningful, uh, it goes in a certain direction towards more, more peace, more joy and more happiness. Uh, there's nothing more you really would want with your life than this uh, spiritual practice that we're trying to do as Buddhists. Uh. So how do we get this right? Uh, how can we get med our meditation in such a way uh, that we actually do enjoy it? Uh. And one of the most uh, fundamental things that the Buddha talks about in the suttas, uh, he talks about the middle way here. Uh. Yeah, I have, some of you have not, never heard about the middle way before? Huh? Okay, so just in case you haven't, the middle way, uh, the Buddha says there's one extreme is a torturing the body here, huh? because that was a very common thing in ancient India. You would sit for a long time, you would kind of sit on a hot rock, you would stand on one leg for one year, you would kind of do all kind of crazy things like that. Yeah, this is known. This, you go to India today, they still do that two and a half thousand years later, they still stand on one leg for one year, one year and they kind of, nothing has really changed in India. This is one of the really nice things about India. You go there, you read the suttas, it looks exactly the same as it did two and a half thousand years ago. Yeah, it's kind of this, uh, this culture. It had, of course, there are changes, uh, but there's a lot of things are still the same there. Uh. And uh, so uh, the Buddha says that that is not a good way of practicing meditation. Yeah? If you torture the body, it doesn't really work. Yeah? On the other hand, you shouldn't indulge the body. Yeah? And when you go on a one-day retreat like this, when there is no silence and we are kind of, you know, just doing good things, you can't really indulge the body very much. Don't worry about that side. The side you should worry about uh, is the torturing of the body here. Uh. And so the idea is to be at ease, uh, to be relaxed, uh, yeah, not to experience too much pain. A little bit of pain is unavoidable because the body is inherently painful, but uh, uh, not too much pain, uh, trying to be at ease. Uh. And so if you feel that you have some pains, yeah, please use these wonderful chairs that are here. Or uh, you can sit on the floor, you can sit on a nice bench like this lady over here. She has a nice bench, meditation bench. That's very good. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, or you have many cushions. Yeah. Sometimes you see people with three cushions at the back, two cushions under the legs, and a couple of extra cushions for the hands, and a kind of cushions everywhere. It's like a surrounded with cushions. So that is also allowable, right? Uh, the Buddha didn't set any limits on the number of cushions. So. <laughs> Which is good news, right? So you can breathe easily. Yeah. So uh, the idea is to feel at ease with the body here, yeah? yeah, and relax with the body. And when you can do that, uh, then the body falls away here. Yeah? The body is no longer important. And that is kind of the important thing here. Yeah? When you get neither pleasure nor pain through the body, yeah, the body falls away, yeah, and the focus is then on the mind instead. Yeah? And this is the idea of the middle way. The focus actually becomes the mind. Yeah? This is the first kind of ease that we should really uh, get to. The body is at ease, uh, the body isn't painful. Uh, and then you want the ease of the mind at also. That means really uh, learning how to relax. Uh, yeah, and uh, relaxing can be surprisingly difficult for people. And one of the reasons why it can be difficult uh, is because we have this idea of I must now meditate, right? Uh, and meditation is done like this. You put forth this kind of effort. You put forth awareness. You grit your teeth to be aware, right? Uh, and you kind of, okay, watch the breath. And you force yourself onto the breath, right? Uh, and this is a very, very, very common thing in meditation circles. It's surprisingly common. And the reason why they're so common uh, is because this is what is often taught. Uh, yeah? And so what we should learn, first of all, and this is in accordance with the suttas of the Buddha, we should learn first of all to give rise to mindfulness. Uh, and then when there is a degree of mindfulness, then you should watch the breath. Uh. So there's always a sequence in things, mindfulness first, uh, then watching the breath. Uh. Too often people think that you actually give rise to mindfulness by watching the breath. But th actually, this is not what the Buddha says. Uh. The Buddha says you first give rise to mindfulness, uh, then you watch the breath afterwards. Uh. So how do we give rise to mindfulness? This is kind of the critical thing here. And the way to do that normally is that you can focus on the feelings in the body a little bit. That you can just have a general sense of awareness, that just learning to relax and kind of enjoy the present, uh, enjoying the good company of being in other, with other meditators, uh, the good company of the Buddha, the Buddha just over here. Hmm. So, the, he, so I have to kind of, uh, he doesn't say very much this particular Buddha, so we have to, uh, 
we had to kind of speak on his behalf, so to speak. Uh, so you're in good company, right? And all of these things, the idea of feeling in a good company, feeling a sense of peace, enjoying what is going on, all of these things, they kind of lead to the mind calming down and mindfulness arising here. But sometimes you just have to wait, uh, wait in the present. Uh, and as you wait, things tend to turn out. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, uh, then you can focus on the body itself, uh, uh, soothing the body, going through the different body parts, uh, whatever really works for you. Uh, and then by going through the body, uh, that gives you a sense of focus uh, and a good sense of focus because you're calming down. Uh, and then the mindfulness may arise as a consequence of that. Uh, but the idea is just to wait yeah, and to kind of be at ease. Uh, so one, a few nice perceptions to use uh, to learn how to wait in the right way. Uh, one that I sometimes use, because sometimes if you are a little bit kind of you're working hard, the mind is a little bit scattered, and maybe you're not fully at ease. I just, I, what, what I use is kind of sitting in my favorite armchair. Uh, yeah, when you have been to work, for example, you've been working really hard, uh, and you come back home after a long day's work, uh, often people just sit down, or maybe they lie down even on their bed, or they sit down in the armchair or whatever they do. Uh, and the idea of sitting down in an armchair after a long day's work, when you are a bit tense or whatever, uh, what do you do at that point? Uh, that is relaxing, right? Uh, and of course, what you do at that point is exactly nothing, uh, right? When you sit down in the armchair after a long day's work, you allow the mind to run. Uh, you allow the mind to unwind. Uh, and when you, if you know what that feels like, uh, yeah, the mind is quite busy, and you just allow it to unwind, uh, after a while, your energy comes back again. Uh, after a while, you're ready to kind of carry on with the, whatever duty that you may have. Uh, and this is exactly what we're trying to do in meditation. Uh, we're trying to wait, uh, allow the mind to kind of unwind by kind of running without forcing it, without doing anything with it. Uh, and because we're not using any more energy through willpower, through doing what, whatever we think we should be doing, uh, the energy returns in your meditation. Uh, the difference between sitting in a favorite armchair and doing meditation is that when energy comes back, you don't get up and continue with your chores. You carry on with that energy and take it further. So this is a nice simile here that you can use as a, you know an idea for how meditation works. Uh, uh, another nice technique which I often use uh, or sometimes use uh, and which you can also try if you like. Uh, and that is to use the idea of death. Are you okay with the idea of dying or is that scary for some of you? If it is scary, don't use it. If you're okay with it, yeah, and I really recommend sometimes contemplating the idea of death. It's a very, very useful contemplation. The idea is that you are, you imagine yourself on your deathbed and you know that one day you will be on your deathbed. And the only time to be ready for that day is now. If you're not ready now, you're probably never going to be ready here. Yeah. Now is the only time. Yeah. And so you imagine yourself on your deathbed. Yeah. yeah. And what, of, what is beautiful about the process of dying, and this is sometimes what you can see in someone who has lived a good life. Yeah. If they have lived a good life, they have two qualities when they're dying. Yeah. One is that they are uh, present, yeah. right? They are, people tend to be somehow present. They tend to be mindful when they're dying. Yeah. And the reason why they're mindful is because they're giving up the world. Yeah. There's nothing more to hold on to in the world, right? If you are in the process of dying, the world becomes unimportant. And so you actually give up, you let go. Yeah? And this is kind of the beautiful thing about the dying process. But not only do you let go, but you also tend to have a sense of clarity when you're dying. You're letting go in a good way. You're not letting go into tiredness and lethargy. Most people tend to, tend to kind of often oscillate between restlessness and lethargy and tiredness. But on your deathbed, that oscillating between tiredness and restlessness doesn't really happen. Uh, it's as if you're able to be peaceful uh, and you're able to be mindful at the same time. Uh, many people, when they become peaceful, they kind of fall asleep uh, or they force themselves on the breath, they become restless. But here, actually unify these two things in one, in one go. Uh, and the reason why that works again uh, is because uh, when you're dying, your interest in the world subsides. Uh, the world becomes irrelevant, yeah? So meditation and dying, when meditation works, it is very similar to the process of dying. Does that sound scary? 
It means you don't know, yeah, during meditation, am I going to die or not? Because it's, it's a similar idea. I remember one of the famous stories that Ajahn Brahm, has anyone here who has never heard of Ajahn Brahm before? Huh? You have heard of him? Yeah, anyone has not heard of Ajahn Brahm? Huh? That's you. you haven't heard of Ajahn Brahm? Okay, one person, two people. Okay, good. And so Ajahn Brahm is uh, kind of the three of us. We have the same teacher. He's in Australia. He's, he's actually English originally, but now he's kind of Aussie, I suppose. So, yeah. After a while, you kind of transfer. So you become Aussie. Huh? I'm Aussie five, as we say down there. Actually, we don't say that. Um, but uh, <laughs> but he, he originally he's from London, actually, right here from Acton. Acton is not it's a bit further west, uh, I think. Uh, and he is our teacher in Australia. And he says he has all these stories about the kind of the old days, the good old days, right? He, the de- good old days. And now he says everything is kind of deteriorated, everything's going downhill. But in the old days, uh, when monks were real monks and these kind of stories. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> So he, uh, he says that uh, one of the, his teachers, again, was a very well-known Thai monk. He was known, uh, known as Ajahn Shah, and probably the most famous meditation master in Thailand in the 20th century. And he had, when all the monks would come and come to the monastery, and he, he had one of the largest number of Western disciples of any monk in Thailand. He had drew people from abroad, both from Asia and also from the West, to him because of his spiritual qualities or uh, whatever. I never met him myself. Uh, and uh, then when a monk or someone would come to the monastery uh, and they would ask, oh, can I please ordain? I want to become a monk. Uh, and he would say, have you come here to die? Uh, and he'd be like, whoa, okay, maybe not, not sure. Okay, that would kind of show your commitment, right? So if you come to die, okay, then in that case, fine, you can become a monk. If you haven't come to die, okay, just hang around for a while. And when you're ready to die, then maybe we'll ordain you. Uh, that, that was kind of the idea. But of course, death, he didn't really mean literally die. Okay, maybe he did actually, yeah. Because you've got to be committed, right, uh, to the path. So it kind of has a double meaning, yeah. So maybe you should be ready to die, here. Yeah. Sometimes uh, we get this idea of death wrong, I think, in the Western world. I think because of our Christian heritage, uh, we think that death is something terrible. Uh, but actually, death itself is not necessarily all that terrible. How you live your life is far more important than whether you live or die, here. Yeah. Yeah, because how you live your life, that is what determines your future in Buddhism. Whether you live or die, well, death is a given anyway. You're going to have to die. So whether you die a bit earlier or later, it's not doesn't make all that much difference as long as you live well. The real tragedy in the world is living badly. That's the real tragedy here, rather actually whether we live or die as such. But anyway, let's leave that aside because that might be a bit challenging as a concept. But the idea of dying is more like the sense of dying as uh, you know as a sense of becoming peaceful uh, letting go a little bit of the sense of self uh, letting go a little bit of the ego uh, yeah this is the idea of dying a little bit in the here and now uh, and what you will find is that that kind of dying is very delightful and very beautiful uh, people think dying is something dying is actually when it's done in the right way done through letting go it is very delightful thing here uh, and you will notice in your own meditation those of you who have been meditating for a while uh, when the ego starts to die down, uh, when the thinking process starts to disappear in your mind, uh, it is a very, very beautiful thing. You become peaceful. Uh, and you start to recognize how the ego, which is the thing which uh, drives the thinking process, drives all the proliferation of the mind. Uh, actually, the ego is terrible. Uh, it's really bad news. Uh, yeah, And it actually, as you allow this to die down, uh, that is where meditation starts to happen. Uh, and that is the other meaning of this idea. Have you come here to die? Have you come here to let go? Have you come here to allow things to fade away? And uh, this ego that we hold onto is just over, made over important. Actually, it is bad news. And you actually recognize that very soon when you start to meditate. The less there is of an ego, the less there is of a sense of self, uh, the more at ease you feel. Uh, the more easy life becomes. Uh, you start flowing through life. Uh, the ego is what creates all these ripples in life, up and down, because we react to the world. It is the ego that reacts to the world. The less there is an ego, you start flowing in life. And that beautiful feeling of flowing in life, yeah, when your mind is in balance, your mind is at ease, you don't become upset so much anymore. You don't become, you know, buffeted around by desires and ill will and these kind of things. And you flow through your life. It's a wonderful and beautiful thing. Yeah? So use the death idea to make yourself more at ease. Uh, okay, how, what does it feel like to die here? Uh, am I ready to die here? Uh, and if you are uh, ready to die in this way, uh, then uh, you start to have this incredible benefit uh, in meditation practice. Uh. 
So these are simple perceptions, yeah, simple ways of actually giving rise to a little bit of a sense of peace. And uh, this is what I would really uh, kind of uh, recommend you to do. And then when uh, the mindfulness kind of becomes uh, established uh, and you start to enjoy yourself, and then you can do whatever kind of meditation object uh, that you like to do. Uh, and you can follow the breath, you can do meta meditation, you can do all of these kind of things. It doesn't really, doesn't really matter so much. Uh, and as you do that, you uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, this process sort of happens by itself. Uh, and this is one of the things that uh, I always found very interesting with uh, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and he would always say that when you meditate, he would say, don't do anything here. And then I think I'm not doing anything and I, nothing happens, right? Uh, but Ajahn, you say that I shouldn't be doing anything, but then nothing happens. Uh, and uh, he would say, well, this is probably because you're doing, so just carry on not doing anything and eventually things will start to happen. And of course, I, I get frustrated, nothing will happen. This was a very common kind of experience with many people here. And then I started to uh, read the suttas, uh, yeah, the word of the Buddha, uh, reading these beautiful teachings and, uh, uh, that are found in this collection which we're using the Pali Canon in Theravada Buddhism. And there I find exactly the same instruction. Uh, the Buddha says that there is no will, no intention, no doing that is required on the path of meditation. Uh, yeah, there is a particular phrase that is used in the Pali to say this. Uh, yeah, literally means that this cannot be done by an act of will or by an act of intention. Uh, and uh, the Buddha says, because why? Well, because this is according to nature. It's dhammata. Dhammata means in accordance with nature. Uh, so the meditation is supposed to be a natural thing, right? Uh, and if you try to make nature do things, uh, if you try to force nature, uh, of course, you cannot force nature. Nature is a, a, means certain laws. It means certain causal relationships. And when those causal relations, those laws actually work, it's just like physics, yeah? You gravity kind of, you go down, you don't go up. If you try to go up, you have to use a lot of willpower. So go with the laws of nature, and then you're okay. And so the Buddha says, you just follow these laws, and you have to allow these laws to work out. And when these laws work out, meditation happens by itself. And that is kind of the idea here. So I started to realize the Buddha and my teacher Ajahn Brahm were actually saying the same thing. You have to allow this process to happen. And of course, the reason why the process doesn't happen, yeah, if, to, if the process doesn't happen, if, if it is a causal sequence of things, you have to go back to the root cause, yeah, the root problem, why it doesn't work. And so what is the root problem according to the sequence of conditions from the Buddha? Let me just tell you what the sequence is, right? Because it's a really, really nice sequence. And if you've never heard this before, this is your chance to get inspired by the word of the Buddha. Huh? So the Buddha says, you start off with what is called sila in the Pali language. Sila means virtue, or it can be also rendered as kindness. And from that kindness comes non-remorse. Yeah, non-remorse is already very nice uh, because you have no, nothing that you regret in your life. You feel really good about yourself. Uh, so non-remorse arises out of kindness. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of, you have a sense of purity within yourself. Uh, you feel that your mind is kind of bright and beautiful because uh, uh, that remorse is missing. Uh, remorse here is a very broad term, but it doesn't just mean kind of, you know, you're kind of really blaming yourself in a harsh way. It means very subtle states of mind uh, where your mind is dragged down a little bit because you're, there's a kind of small, tiny amount of self-blame there, which you can't even see sometimes. Uh, so the more purity you have in your life, the better you live, uh, the less remorse, the less of this darkness you have in your mind. Uh, so non-remorse. Uh, non-remorse, what does that lead to? It leads to a sense of gladness. Uh, it's called pamuja, pamuja in the Pali language, uh, yeah? Gladness or joy here. Yeah. That gladness and joy leads to pity. Pity means rapture. Yeah. Rapture is even more joy, more powerful joy. Yeah, joy which starts to become really, really pleasant and really nice. Yeah. What does that joy lead to? Yeah. Well, if you keep on meditating on that joy, yeah, the joy leads to tranquility. Yeah. Tranquility in turn leads to even more profound happiness. Yeah. And then that profound happiness eventually goes all the way to the stillness of the mind. So stillness of the mind is even more tranquility. Huh? And then that stillness of the mind ultimately leads to what is called seeing, not knowing and seeing according to reality. Huh? And then it goes even further all the way to the final liberation of the path huh? and to become an arahant or maybe, you know, whatever it is. Huh? 
And so that is what meditation is about. People think meditation is about watching pain in the body. Sometimes people think that, but actually, if you look at the psychology of meditation, the first person experience of meditation, how it actually described in the suttas, how it described through mindfulness of breathing, through the sequence of dependent liberation, through the seven factors of awakening. These are various core teachings of the Buddha. These are all very core teachings. Uh, yeah, It actually is always expressed in this way. Uh, that is just so wonderful, isn't it? And when I read these things, I remember reading these things in the beginning. I thought everyone is talking about dukkha in Buddhism, suffering. Uh, what about what happened to all this sukkha? Here the Buddha is talking about sukkha all the way. Happiness, joy, uh, rapture, tranquility, all these beautiful things. Uh, why don't we talk more about these things? Uh, because this is the real selling point of Buddhism. Uh, everyone in the world wants happiness. Uh, if we talk too much about dukkha, everyone says we are so pessimistic in Buddhism, uh, right? Uh, and this is what you hear very often. We are too pessimistic. Uh, so we need to kind of change our marketing strategy here. Yeah, it actually matters how we present these teachings because they always can be seen from different angles. Uh, so give the right kind of angle. Uh, and I don't know, when I read those teachings i always wonder how come the whole world isn't buddhist uh, yeah to me everyone should be a buddhist when you read these beautiful teachings uh, yeah there is very difficult to find anything quite like these buddhist teachings uh, when you when you you know really get into them and you start to understand what's going on there so if there is so much beauty and so much powerful things available on the buddhist path uh, how come we're not always blissing out then shouldn't we always be blissing out in meditation well this is why we need to use this causal sequence i'm talking about uh, and we need to come back to the root cause uh, when you understand the root cause of the sequence uh, that is when you know what it is that you need to do uh, for this uh, process to work uh, right uh, and of course the root cause in all the sequence is sila as i just mentioned before sila is basically morality or ethics or kindness or uh, you know, how you live your life, the quality of your heart, and all of these kind of, that's what sila really is about. Uh, so when you, once you know that it is sila, which is the root cause, it can also be faith, by the way, or confidence as well. This is an alternative way of uh, looking at the sequence, but usually sila is the critical thing. Uh, so once you know that, uh, you know what it is that you have to do uh, to make the sequence work. Uh, what is that you have to do? You have to practice your ethics even better. You have to become even more moral. And that does not mean that I think you are a bad person. Yeah, I have no idea, no, I have no doubt that you are a very good person. Otherwise, what on earth are you doing here? Bad people don't come to kind of think these kind of places, right? Is there anyone who's bad here? Yeah, you see, I told you there's no one bad here. So, I, I mean, so, so uh, yeah, but the problem is that. The Buddhist idea of ethics is very profound, uh, and it's very detailed, uh, and it has to do with our entire being. It is not just about kind of our outward action, but how we are as human beings, how we think, how we perceive, uh, how we relate to the world in a very deep way. Uh, so it's a very, very demanding kind of ethics. Uh, and it's not just the negative ethics of avoiding the bad things, but it's the positive ethics uh, of doing the good things. Uh, and all of these things come together in Buddhist ethics. Uh, so... Right? So no wonder, so even though you are very good already, and I have no doubt that you are very good, because otherwise you wouldn't be here, but still, you're probably not perfect. So is anyone here perfect? Yeah, so you're neither bad nor perfect. Yeah, you're somewhere in between there. I just proved that because no one raised their hand. <laughs> it's a bit dodgy proof, right? <laughs> anyway, so you can always do a bit better. So that is where the uh, meditation comes from. From really purifying your ethics uh, and that is true in daily life this is why we need to integrate the spiritual path into all of our daily life uh, you cannot really separate ordinary life from meditation or the spiritual path. everything has to become one thing uh, in fact everything has to be subsumed under the heading of spirituality spirituality comes on top and then everything else comes underneath yeah your family life your work life your whatever it is that you do uh, kind of take second uh, second rank under sp the spiritual path. Spiritual paths are always at the top. Uh, and of course, the beauty of that is that your ordinary life also tends to kind of become very peaceful and harmonious and nice uh, if you put the spiritual life at the kind of top uh, position here. And it also means that when you come here right now, yeah, we should actually tap into some of those good things that we have been doing here. 
Yeah, and one of the ways of doing that is to be aware of the fact that we live a good life, uh, uh, keep the five precepts, that we're trying our very best to do all of these things. Uh, yeah, tapping into that, have a sense of uh, appreciation for what we are trying to do. Uh, and even if not, if not perfect, uh, you have to learn to forgive yourself for your, your imperfections uh, and learn to appreciate the fact that you're doing something very good in the world by living well. Uh, and sometimes we don't have enough appreciation for ourselves. Uh, because when you do things like keep the five precepts, uh, when you don't steal, you don't lie, you treat people in a friendly way, you don't use harsh speech, uh, all of these things. When you do that, you're actually giving people around you a sense of freedom, uh, freedom from fear that you're going to take advantage of them, freedom from uh, being uh, spoken to in a kind of harsh way or whatever, yeah? You're giving people a sense of ease. Uh, they can relax around you. They can really kind of feel at, wow, so nice to be around a person like this. And that psychological freedom that you give people in the world is a very, very important thing here. Yeah? And very often it has a ripple effect. Uh, yeah, if you are nice to someone else, uh, that, that person gets touched by you uh, and it ripples out to other people afterwards. Uh, I have noticed that in my own life, how I someone else is really kind to me yeah maybe i'm a bit grumpy or something or a bad day or whatever and someone is kind to me and then i i suddenly my mood changes completely because someone is kind to me and then i want to be kind to others it can kind of happen like that and so it ripples out into society so every time you do something kind every time you are generous every time you speak kindly to someone right it very often it will go to the heart and then it will spread out into society around you so remind yourself of that Remind yourself that you're doing things that really are really valuable in this world by living a life of ethics and morality in this way. Remind yourself that when you are gener generous, uh, it often has also a tremendous effect. Uh, I often remind people in Perth because there are very, people there are, we have a large, large Buddhist community down in Perth in Western Australia, uh, thousands of people who are members of our Buddhist society. Uh, and uh, very often they're very generous to our Buddhist society. Uh, and I often like to remind them that when you are generous to our Buddhist society, you're not just generous to our Buddhist society. Yeah? You're not just gener generous to Venerable Chanda and the Anukampa project when you support them. Yeah? Yeah? What you are generous towards is this large movement we call Buddhism yeah? that spreads out in the world. We're spreading these teachings out to millions of people in the world. Yeah? Someone like Ajahn Brahm was my teacher in Perth. He literally a single talk can reach millions of people, right? Because they're all watching him on YouTube or whatever. Huh? And so it kind of spreads out to the whole world. Huh? And when you give something uh, to that cause, uh, yeah, huh? you have a part of that. Huh? You have a part of spreading happiness into the world, uh, of reducing suffering in the world. Uh, that is what generosity does. Huh? And once you think like that, you think, wow, this is wonderful. Huh? Yeah, and then it actually starts to have an effect within you. You're, you change psychologically because you start to understand what you're doing here. So sometimes we have to appreciate, we have to think about how we do things in the right way. Here. And when you think about the effect of your kindness, uh, when you think about the effect of your generosity, uh, when you think about these things in the right way, it lifts your mind up uh, and it makes you ready for meditation practice. Uh. And then uh, once you start to understand this, then you go back to your life yeah you come to, you finish here today and you go back to work or whatever and because you start to understand the power of kindness the power of generosity you start to live differently yeah? you start to become a different person in your daily life because it gets lodged in your mindfulness uh, lodged at the back of your mind uh, and you carry these ideas with you into your ordinary life and you become a better person you come back on the retreat again yeah and you re-establish the these teachings in your mind uh, and then you go back to life and it gets uh, strengthened again uh, and it kind of builds up in this way, yeah, back and forth, building, building, building. Yeah. And this is how the path gradually progresses. Uh. So uh, this is kind of the idea behind all of this. Uh, yeah. And uh, if you can tap into some of these good feelings, uh, first of all, you establish mindfulness, uh, you sit comfortably, uh, you are at ease, uh, you let go a little bit, uh, and you feel a sense of ease in body and mind. Uh, and as you feel that sense of ease in body and mind, uh, you allow mindfulness uh, to gradually arise. Uh, to strengthen that mindfulness, uh, you enjoy the good company. This is maybe the easiest way sometimes of finding a sense of 
feeling good, yeah, when you are in good company, huh? you think, wow, I'm so fortunate to be part of this, yeah, the Buddha is here, his teachings are here, we've got some monastics here, we have all, the, all of these lay uh, practitioners who are here, everyone kind of coming together in this beautiful way, listening to the powerful word of the Buddha, huh? actually, it is very uplifting when you get that in, uh, get that um, recollection uh, going for you in the right way, huh? or you just remember the fact of your, how you live your life in a good way, huh? And these things then give rise to uplift in the mind, strengthens your mindfulness. Then you can go to the mindfulness of breathing. And mindfulness of breathing yeah, and how to use that are the things I will talk about more uh, after lunch. So at one o'clock or whatever it is that we're going to carry on with this. Uh, that is a very brief uh, introduction for you. Just some very basic ideas on meditation. I say these things every time I teach meditation, so I apologize for those of you who heard it before, but uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, it's nice to have it uh, uh, reviewed anyway, I guess, maybe. Huh? <laughs> so uh, let's try to do some meditation together here. Huh? Does anyone need a break? Or are, you, are you all right? Huh? Yeah, it's going to be about 40, 40 minutes meditation, and we're going to have a lunch out. If you need a break, just please, uh, please do so at any, any point. Too. That's good, get the coughing out of the way, and then you're, you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay. Good. There's nothing worse than trying to hold back your coughing, and then you, you erupt like a volcano after a while because your coughing has been so suppressed, you know. So just if you're going to do it, do it, as I say. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so you start off by closing your eyes. And uh, it's one of the starting points and just closing your eyes is actually quite nice because you uh, tune out of so much of that information that comes through the eyes uh, so much our mental space is uh, preoccupied by the faculty of sight uh, so that, leave that to one side by closing your eyes and then you can start to feel your body properly uh, so feel your body and uh, make sure that you are nice and at ease uh, we're going to be sitting here for about 40 minutes or so, I hope you're okay with that. And uh, uh, so find that ease and comfort uh, of the body here. And uh, when the body is uh, nice and uh, uh, you have no pains and problems in the body, uh, the next stage is then to learn how to really relax. Uh, and the deeper you can relax, uh, the better it will be for the meditation. Uh, you take a lot of time just to, again, find the ease of the mind. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that is to actually experience the body, because body and mind are always tied together. Uh, and you can often feel the lack of ease in the mind uh, by tensions in the body. Uh, so focus on the body and allow those tensions to dissipate. Uh, take a few deep breaths in the beginning, uh, for example, uh, and just gradually have a sense of kindness and compassion towards yourself uh, and allow yourself to find that ease in the body. Uh, often uh, it is just a matter of taking time, uh, of being patient uh, and just waiting in the present. Uh,
And uh, if you can remember the simile of the armchair, uh, you're not trying to meditate. Uh, the trying often gets in the way. Uh, all you're really doing is learning to relax, uh, not doing anything here, uh, allowing the energy to come back into the mind, uh, dissipating all the tiredness that has kind of weighing us down uh, through the week and through the day here. Uh, to sit back, relax, and just allow uh, the mind to calm down by itself. You will tend to find that when you let go in this way, that the mind does one of two things. Uh, either it is tired uh, or it keeps on thinking. Uh, and in both of these cases, uh, don't try to control these things. Uh, meditation is not, not about controlling the mind, uh, but it is really about allowing the mind to be here. Uh, if you do feel tired, uh, don't fight the tiredness. Uh, just go with the flow and see what happens. Uh, if you do find the mind thinking, uh, again, don't uh, suppress the thinking or try to control it, uh, but allow it to happen. Uh, and as you allow it to happen, uh, and you just try to watch what is going on, uh, these things tend to disappear gradually over time. Uh.
And you can just imagine yourself like a passenger on the train. As a passenger on the train, you have no choice about the scenery. You look through the window and the scenery is always changing. But there's nothing much you can do about it. You just observe, you just sit back and you just accept whatever is going on. Meditation is a bit like that. You are a passenger, not a driver. So don't judge the scenery, don't judge the thoughts, uh, don't judge the sounds coming from outside. Uh, just allow things to pass by uh, without interaction, uh, without any kind of uh, rejection or acceptance. Uh, just a bare awareness of what is going on. Uh, and as you do that, you gradually learn to flow with phenomena, uh, uh, trying to control uh, or trying to uh, do anything about it. Uh.
And uh, if you find that the mind is lacking in energy, uh, uh, very useful to do is to again lift the mind up a little bit by some sort of a positive reflection. Uh, and maybe often the most powerful reflection uh, is simply to remind yourself of the good company that you are in. Uh, what a blessing it is to have people like this uh, who are like minded, who enjoy this kind of practice, uh, who can support you in this practice, uh, leading in the same direction. Uh, people who are good spiritual friends. Uh, how fortunate I am to have people like this uh, in my life, uh, uh, heading in the same direction to me, as me uh, and leading to similar kind of results. Uh.
And uh, if you do start to calm down a little bit, uh, maybe even experiencing a little bit of joy, uh, please notice those beautiful feelings and perceptions that arise in the mind. Uh, and you will notice and be able to uh, feel that freedom from all the duties of life, uh, all the things that you have to do in ordinary life. Uh, all of that is gone. Uh, and what replaces it is a sense of ease, uh, a sense of peace, uh, a sense of the self dying down. Uh, notice how delightful that is. Uh, and as you notice that, your mind will incline in that direction uh, towards meditation, uh, towards the spiritual path. Uh.
And uh, as you carry on in this way, uh, there may come a point when you suddenly feel that the breath is there, uh, the breath is present, uh, as if the breath is coming to you rather than you going to the breath. Uh, and then when your breath arises in this way, uh, in a sense, you're already doing the breath meditation. Uh, make sure when you do this that the breath is more like a companion. Uh, the breath is not someone you control. Uh, the breath is not like, uh, the breath is someone you're walking with uh, rather than someone you are observing. Uh, and it means a very light kind of touch with the breath, uh, allowing the breath to come and go pretty much the way it wants. Uh, it's like a friend, uh, not someone you're controlling. Uh.
Yeah, it's not coming close to the end now. Uh, before we come to the end, just take a few moments to evaluate your meditation there. If you do feel a bit more peaceful and relaxed than it is, uh, ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, and if you don't, also ask yourself the same question there. Uh, Okay, so that is the um, end of the meditation for now. So uh, uh, let's have a nice lunch uh, and then we'll meet again at one o'clock after lunch. Uh.